What should be the role of money and markets in our society? When I was a kid, Serene and Rob, maybe you had the same experience. If you went to an amusement park, part of the experience was waiting in long lines for the popular rides. That, no one liked waiting in the lines, but that was just what happened. Today, that's no longer true. In most amusement parks, if you don't like standing in long lines, and if you have the money, you can buy a fast track or VIP ticket, pay extra, and jump to the head of the line. This is a small aspect of social life, hardly the, hardly the most grievous moral challenge we face. It also happens in another place, in Washington, D.C., on Capitol Hill, when Congress holds hearings. They set aside a certain number of seats for the public on a first-come, first-served basis. There are many people who want to sit in on the congressional hearings, especially if it's a hot issue, but who don't want to stand in the long lines that sometimes form a day in advance, sometimes two or three days in advance. It's now possible, if you don't want to stand in the line to attend the congressional hearing, to go to a company, pay them a certain amount of money, and they will hire someone, a homeless person, or someone else who needs the work, to stand in the line for you. You pay the company $50 an hour. If the line is two, three, four days long, it's quite an expensive seat. But if you're a lobbyist, you don't have time to spare. And so you can pay to get a place at the head of the line. And when the hearing begins, you can claim your front row seat. One of the companies that specializes in providing this service is called linestanding.com. They will also get you a seat if you want to sit in on oral arguments before the US Supreme Court. So if you were keen to hear the oral arguments over Obamacare over, or over same-sex marriage, you could pay $50 an hour to linestanding.com and they would hire someone who would wait as long as it took to assure that you got in. Take another, a very different kind of example. If you're a drug company and want to market a new drug to increase your market share, we take this for granted now most European countries don't allow it, but you can market it directly to consumers on television. You've probably seen those ads on the nightly news or on sporting events. In fact, if you've watched those ads, those incessant ads for prescription drugs, you could be forgiven for thinking that the greatest health crisis in the world is not malaria or sleeping sickness or river blindness, but a rampant epidemic of erectile dysfunction marketing drugs directly to consumers. We didn't always do it. Congress made it permissible a couple of decades ago. Or take an even more fateful kind of example, the way we fight our wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. There were more private military contractors on the ground than there were US military troops. Now, this isn't because we ever had a public debate about whether we wanted to outsource war to private companies. But this is, this is what has happened over the past three decades. Almost without realizing it, we've drifted from having a market economy to becoming a market society. The difference is this. A market economy is a tool a valuable and effective tool for organizing productive activity. But a market society is a place where everything is up for sale. It's a way of life in which market values and market thinking begin to reach into almost every sphere of life. Family life, personal relations, health, education, civic life, politics. And so the question I would like to put to you for discussion this evening is, why should we worry? Should we worry about becoming a market society? I think there are at least two reasons to worry, but I want to get your thoughts about it. The first is that 
The more things money can buy, the more it hurts to be poor, the more it matters whether you're affluent or poor. If the only thing money governed access to were fancy vacations and BMWs, inequality wouldn't matter all that much. But against a background of rising inequality, putting a price on everything, the rampant commodification of social life makes things, makes it harder to be poor. If money governs access, as it does, to where you live, whether you live in a safe neighborhood or a crime-ridden one, where you can, whether you can send your kids to a good school or a not very good school, what political voice you have, then, Inequality matters a lot more than it otherwise would. So one reason to worry is that if more and more of life is commodified, how much money you have looms much larger. But there's also a second worry, reason to worry about becoming a market society. And that has to do with a, something subtler, the tendency of market thinking and market values to crowd out or to erode non-market values worth caring about. Now, to explore this aspect of commodification or the marketization of social life, I'd like to see what you think about a certain story, an example. To do with the walrus hunt in the Arctic, in the north of Canada, for centuries, the Inuits built their lives around subsistence walrus hunting. And then, in the 19th century, uh, more and more came to hunt the more and more people came, hunters, to hunt the walrus. And the walrus is not very good at defending itself. They are very slow, unthreatening creatures. They were no match for hunters with guns, the population was decimated. And so the Canadian government banned walrus hunting, but carved out an exception, a small exception, a quota of walruses that the Inuit people could continue to hunt to preserve their way of life. Decades passed, and then recently, the Inuit people came to the Canadian government with a proposal, a proposal in the spirit of the age, I suppose you could say. They said, look, we, we could use some extra income. Won't you let us sell our quota of walruses to big game hunters who would like to come shoot them? We won't increase the number of walruses shot. We'll keep within our quota. But if we can sell the right to shoot the walruses, then we can make new income. As guides, we'll take the hunters out, we'll show them where the walruses are, they will shoot them, we'll harvest them, skin them, we will use the skin and the meat and the blubber just as we always have done. But now we will have a new source of income. Now, from the standpoint of standard economic reasoning, this seems like a pretty unobjectionable proposal. No more wal walruses are killed than would otherwise be the case. Everybody is better off. There are big game hunters now who have the chance to do what they couldn't do before, go up to the Arctic and shoot a walrus. The Inuit community will make more money. So from the standpoint of standard economic reasoning, it sounds like a pretty good deal. And yet some people object. Let's hear what people, I'd like to hear what people here have to say about this case. If you were the Canadian government, if you were making the policy, what would be your view? Let's just see by a show of hands, how many would, how, how many would give them the right to sell their walrus hunting quotas? Raise your hand. And how many would not? All right, so we have a pretty good division, which is a great point to begin a conversation. 
pretty good division of the, of the room. Let's first hear from someone who objects, someone who would not grant them the right to sell the quota. It's like a tradable permit. We, it's used in many areas of policy. What would be wrong with that? Someone who objects, who can articulate a reason? Um, I'm afraid that this might uh, lead to some sort of an arms race kind of a situation where once they see this money stream, uh, you know, then others will offer more money to buy these licenses and then Inuit could go and lobby the Canadian government, why don't you increase the number of walruses we can kill uh, because we'll generate more income and, uh, right. and we'll give you a cut as uh, some sort of a tax to the Canadian government and so they would see right. it's win, win, win all the way right. except for the walruses, uh, you know, so. <laughs> Something the walruses like, wouldn't win on that scenario, so it's, it's, on the it's, arms race scenario. It's, it's a bit of the slippery slope. So the argument. slippery slope to killing more walruses because everyone will want a piece of the <laughs> revenue. No, that's all right. But let me just ask you this. Does that mean that provided we could prevent the further demand to kill more walruses, it, it's okay? It will lead to you mean as a practical matter, they will see a revenue-raising opportunity here, and, that will happen. and it will prove irresistible? Uh, yes, it will prove irresistible. Right? All right. So now that's an objection that worries about how this thing will unfold. And you're worried about the walrus <laughs> losing out in the end. Um, but it's different from the objection in principle that was raised that just finds it somehow morally objectionable to cater to, the, to these preferences, desires to shoot a walrus. That, that doesn't bother you. Uh, we don't apply it uniformly. We kill, uh, unless you are a vegetarian, you're killing all kinds of animals and then we sure. don't seem to be worried about that. So why are we worried about walruses? Okay, let's see if there's someone else. <laughs> let's see if there's someone else. Uh, yes, in the blue shirt. I think, I guess I go by a principle that cultures require some kind of uh, principle, rules of some kind uh, that are not up for sale. I mean, uh, and while in this case you're asking the Canadian government to impose a particular rule or to reinforce a traditional rule uh, of the Inuit upon the Inuit when they decide that, or at least some of their representatives are asking for uh, relaxation of that rule, I would say, um, you know, in most cases I would, I would not want to, to have a commodification of a particular valuable cultural property like that. But what, is, what actually is being commodified here? What value is being commodified, do you think? The same number of walruses are dying. No more until the slippery slope kicks in. <laughs> but just on the matter of principle, well, well, the what, what symbolic, value is being commodified? The symbolic universe, you're changing the symbolic universe of the culture, okay, which may have already been changed by other factors. Which, yeah. But in any case, you're, you're institutionalizing the if the wall, I don't know Inuit culture well enough to know if the walrus has some kind of, you know, uh, role in it. But in any case, by selling this right, you're changing the symbolic universe in a way that... All right, changing the symbolic universe somehow. All right, we'll have to try to elaborate that a little bit. Let's see, see if there's someone who... All right, what, what would you say? Yes. Um, do you care about the way of life of the uh, native people up there? And if so, that's something the government gave thought to. And if they're going to sell the hunting rights, that changes their way of life. So I, I don't know the answer to where that leads, but that does change things. Right. And the other topic is, as the government, the Canadian government, do you just say, well, you know, X number are okay to kill, that they, right. they can maintain the population. Yes. And if that's the way you want to go, then right. you say, okay, well then, whoever pays the most to kill each one, is that, as a government, what oh, you want to do? Oh, that's interesting. So there's, you know, I'm not quite sure. Why it, not auction off directly right, then the right? You know, someone for a million dollars can go kill one, and the Canadian government would maximize income that way. And that, and probably they don't want to do that, because probably if they think that hunting is a sport that people should all do the same, right. they just want to control the number killed, but not necessarily allow just the h highest bidders to do it. Right. But separately, do they want the native people to continue their way of life? Okay, that's interesting. Why not just let the Canadian government specify the number of walruses and then have an outright auction? 
What do you suppose, by the way, the, uh, the market, going market rate is for coming and shooting a walrus? I don't know. You I, don't, I know? don't know? but it's probably but pretty guess. high, and probably lots of people who like to hunt yeah. couldn't afford it. And then you have the whole question, does a sport become um, something that's just to the higher bidder, or right. is it something that people as, as citizens should right, equally right. have access to a lottery or whatever? Right. Help. Okay. Let's let's hear if there are some. We've heard a number of people who are uneasy with this policy, but at least half the half the gathering here favored it. So let's hear now from someone who, who having heard the arguments against, has a rejoinder. Um, I think the Inuits they have the rights to um, get more uh, welfare from the Canadian government to advance. Um, their well-being. Right. And I think that's a legitimate cause for them to, right. to trade and sell this. And this legitimate cause will override the animal protectionism, which is um, in favor of the rights for walrus. I think um, people the, will wait, think... Wait, wait, wait. The animal protectionism, though. Remember, no more walruses are dying. What's the animal protectionism claim? I think, well... The animal protectionism is um, the argument of the professor, the slippery... Oh, slope. I see. The worry that sooner or later more yeah. will be taken. If we, um, if we take out that possibility, then I think um, the Inuits definitely have a legitimate cause to... Walruses, it's not like hunting a, a rhinoceros mm -hmm. or a, a lion or something where there is the thrill of the chase, where it's risky, where it's challenging where it is at least a kind of sport, or so I'm told. Mm -hmm. he, the walrus doesn't run away. The boat comes right up <laughs> within 15 feet. And one, uh, there was an account of this in a New York Times Magazine article that described this going to shoot a walrus like taking a very long boat ride to shoot a beanbag chair. <laughs> Yeah. Now, I think that's behind the suggestion that there's something, well, unworthy or even maybe perverse in the desire to do this. Why do you want to do it? Actually, the reason they want to is not for the sport and the thrill. It's because hunting organizations have lists of, uh, that, that hunters aspire to complete. The, the Arctic Five or the... I don't know, the Serengeti Five. And so the walrus is one of the ones on the list. So let's suppose that that's the reason. It can't be for the thrill of it. What do you say to the argument that, the, that social policy, and economic reasoning even, shouldn't count certain preferences if they're base and unworthy, like this one? What, what would you say to that? Um, I think um, we have a lot of unworthy desires in our daily lives and those people if they don't if they don't instead of killing walrus they might probably end up killing like people on the street <laughs> and i would say that that kind of act activity is a recreational activity that help people to release their desire and people would pay for that because there's a demand for releasing that desire and i think m m commodifying this uh activity is a good way for the society to release that kind of <laughs> to release desire that and at the same time generate some welfare that can benefit the Inuits well, you're at, it. at the end yeah. of the day. I see. Okay, so the, you have a kind of moral economy of violence or, or of vice <laughs> such that if it's, if it's not given expression here, it'll come out there, so why not let them shoot walruses? Is there someone else who would like to defend the policy against the objections that we've heard? Hearing the argument, I'm a walrus and I'd be a lot happier with some sensible regulation that would help ensure that more walruses weren't killed absent that regulation. All right. It's so a version of the slippery slope, right, but it's so from it's the side the of the worry. Back to possibility the that it would go without regulation that's sensible to All contain right. the kill. But now we're assuming, assuming that there is regulation in place and that it won't give way, which admittedly could be challenged. Who else, who else would like to reply in defense of this? I guess I would make an argument um, in terms of the Inuit's right and uh, saying who are we or who is the Canadian government to have any say in the rights that they would have had if Canada doesn't exist in the first place. Right. In which case, 
they could do whatever they wanted with the walruses. So that would be my argument in so response. So you agree there should be a, a limit to protect the walruses, but what they do with their quota is up to them. Yeah, well, I think that the, one of the arguments against it sort of has a sense of um, protectionism of another culture that I think is hard to justify to say, well, we think that this is the way you've always done that, and it's a, I think it's a false belief that cultures need to remain uh, stagnant over yeah. time when they don't, in fact. So the, those who would prevent them selling their quotas mm. are imposing on the Inuit community a certain yeah. conception about what's for their own good. Yeah. All right, there, there's another example. This one from American history of a policy that enabled people to buy and sell a certain kind of quota. Military service during the Civil War. The first draft law in the North, Abraham Lincoln's draft law, had the provision that if you were, uh, th there, was a lot, there was a lottery and there was conscription community by community. And if you were drafted to fight in the Civil War and didn't want to go and had the money, you could hire a substitute to take your place. People ran ads in the classified ad sections of newspapers, uh, advertising, offering money for substitutes, $1,000 up to $1,500 typically, which was a lot of money in those days, to go take your place to fight in the Civil War. Now, both parties, you think about it from the standpoint of economic reasoning, both parties are better off. It was worth it for the person hiring the substitute, otherwise they wouldn't have offered the money. It was worth it for the person who agreed to serve in his place. Now, all right, let's take a quick vote on, on that one. How many, and here let's ask whether people find this, um, find this system objectionable or acceptable. How many find it objectionable? And how many find it acceptable? Okay, a handful. Most people here consider the Civil War system unfair. Let's see, how many people think it's that an all-volunteer army of the kind we currently have is unfair? And how many think it is fair? How many think that the all-volunteer army is a fair way of allocating military service? A lot of people are not voting. <laughs> All right, what these, what these examples suggest, and this really is the beginning, not the end, of a discussion about how military service should be allocated and whether it should be by the labor market. One question we would need to ask is what value exactly is being violated? Why should military service not be allocated by the labor market, but most other jobs are? What is it about military service? We let people buy and, buy and sell other, their labor in other areas of life, including risky ones. What is different, or is there something intrinsically different about military service in this respect? Someone who voted, who thinks, doesn't like the volunteer army should probably answer. Go ahead. Because of patriotism and loyalty to one's country. And why do, why do patriotism and loyalty to one's country mean that you shouldn't buy and sell military service? Because it seems that, um, you know, seeing that the country is giving you so much, you, would, you should have a duty to your country and not sell that responsibility to someone else and try to get out of that duty. It's... Inherent, like it's basically something you have to do because of what the country has done for you, so you can't just sell that. So if it's a civic duty, right. then there seems something wrong with hiring someone else to perform it. Right. So if you're called to jury du duty, yes. you're not allowed to hire a substitute to take your place. Mm -hmm. Or for that matter, y your vote. It's an interesting question for, from an economic standpoint. Why should there not be a free market in votes? Many people don't even use their vote in the election. So what's wrong with it? Well, if you're right about civic duty, we do hesitate to allow people to sell off or hire other people to fulfill their civic duties. What these two examples illustrate, the walrus hunting and the question of military service and civic duty, is that we hesitate 
to allow buying and selling of, a, of social practices or duties if we think that some other value, some higher value, is at stake, some higher norm, patriotism and loyalty, or the desire to accommodate the way of life of the Inuit people. But if this is true, then there are two, I think, two implications for the way we do economics that we need to consider. Economists often assume that markets are inert, that they do not touch or taint or change the goods they exchange. And this may be true enough if we're talking about material goods, like flat screen televisions. If you sell me a flat screen television or give me one as a gift, it will work just the same either way. The value of the television won't vary depending on whether there was a market relationship. But the same may not be true when we're talking about health or education or the environment or the respect for the community and culture of peoples. Same may not be true when we're talking about civic duties. In cases like these, subjecting social practices to market valuation and exchange may change their meaning, may change the character of the goods. And it may do so by crowding out, the market values may crowd out values, norms, attitudes, worth caring about. If that's true, then to decide where markets belong and where they don't, it's not enough to engage in economics as if it were a value-neutral science of choice. That's how economics has presented itself. Really, since early in the 20th century, as a value-neutral science, of choice. But if market reasoning and market practices crowd out values, norms, attitudes, non-market goods, then we have to ask in any given instance where we would use a market mechanism, what are the goods at stake in the practice? Whether they are civic goods or communal goods or cultural goods or environmental ones, and will marketizing the practice drive those out, or diminish, or, or, or erode them. But this carries a big implication for economics, which is it has to reconnect with its origins in moral and political philosophy. Back when economics was invented, the classical economists from Adam Smith to Karl Marx and John Stuart Mill, they all understood their subject economics to be a subfield of moral and political philosophy. And as markets today reach into more and more spheres of social life, that feature of economics is one that I think we need to reconnect with. Economics has to be re-understood as a, as a branch of moral philosophy. There is a second consequence for if it's true that marketizing goods drives out certain attitudes and norms worth caring about. And it's, it's a consequence for our public discourse during the same period that we've drifted into having a market society. Our public discourse has become emptied of larger meaning. Politics has become narrowly kind of managerial and technocratic. And then we have the shouting matches on cable television and talk radio and on the floor of Congress. And people wonder why. And sometimes the answer they give is that too many people believe too deeply in their moral convictions. I think something closer to the opposite is true. I think the reason our public discourse is so impoverished is that it fails to engage with larger questions of meaning and moral purpose, including questions about how to value goods, how to value the, the social goods embodied in practices from health to education to the environment to civic life. Now, we tend to shy away. We tend to shy away from engaging directly with arguments about the meaning of goods in public life. And the reason we shy away 
is we realize these are controversial judgments. People disagree about them. And so we reach for a kind of public discourse that's empty of those big questions. And so I think the rise of market reasoning, this is part of the appeal of market reasoning. It seems to offer a value neutral way of making social choice that seems to spare us the need to engage in debate about the character of goods. But it's a false promise. It's led to the hollowing out, the emptiness of public discourse that we see all around us. It explains, I think, why citizens of democracies, not just here, but around the world, are frustrated with the terms, the alternatives being offered by political parties and by politicians. And so I think a reason, I think we have two reasons to reconnect with big questions in public discourse about economics. One is, it's the only way we will be able to decide as a democratic society where markets serve the public good and where they don't belong. And second, it's the only way to elevate the terms of our public discourse, to engage with big things. Nobody is inspired by technocratic managerial talk. I don't suggest that we will all agree if we have a morally more robust kind of public discourse. But I do think we will make this democracy better, we'll cultivate habits of listening and learn, listening to and learning from one another, even where the disagreements persist. And we also may develop a keener sense of the price we pay for drifting toward a society where everything is up for sale. Thanks. First of all, thank you. That's very inspiring and, uh, I would say, taking the lid off the can of worms that we have to, uh, to delve into. As I listen to your two examples about the Inuit, and I have done a little bit of running around up in high latitudes myself. But not hunting. I'm sorry? Not hunting. You've been fishing up there, not oh, hunting. Sailing. Sailing. Sailing, sailing. okay. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and also when you talked about the uh, question of a voluntary army. The thing that makes me uncomfortable is that when economists talk about episodes like that, they talk about them as though they're devoid of context. A voluntary army will naturally push people who are closer to despair into risking their lives. And that's not a free choice. That's yeah. a coerced choice. Yeah. In my experience in dealing with uh, Eskimo culture, they pay tribute to the animals they kill as part of their organic system and, their, and the feelings they have relative to the spirits and the gods. And when they start to let other guys come in for sport and shoot those animals to take money, are they not deforming something mm -hmm. that's dear to their traditions, mm -hmm. which they're doing as a choice out of despair to take care of people in a, in a culture that's fighting for subsistence. So I, I experience some abrasion mm -hmm. in these examples yeah. that they're really not free choices. They're, they're coerced choices, and right. we're just not acknowledging that we're pushing people up against the wall before yeah. they make the choice. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting observation. And I think what it points to is there are really two, and I think this helps force us to distinguish between two different questions we need to ask before we can decide whether to marketize a certain social practice. One of them is, is the choice really free? How voluntary is the exchange? Because part of the appeal of markets is that it involves the voluntary exchange among willing participants. So for example, in the debate about whether there should be a free market in organs for transplantation, kidneys, let's say, most countries don't permit it. But 
One objection would be just along the lines that you mentioned, Rob, that if, if, it, uh, if there were marketing kidneys and the sellers were desperately poor peasants in the developing world who were under great economic compulsion to feed their families, to provide an education for their family, it would be hard to call that choice free. We would say, uh, we might well say that the that the coercion is built into the necessity of their situation, if it's a desperate deal. So that's one issue. How free is it? Is the choice? And then the second issue is, even if the choice is free, it might still be degrading. Take the debate about prostitution. Some object to prostitution on the ground that typically prostitutes are, are, are coerced, in effect, by drug addiction or desperate need for money. But then we could ask, all right, what about, a, imagine a roughly equal society, or imagine prostitutes who were not under great economic necessity, who freely chose that work. Would that remove all possible objection? Well, not necessarily, because there would still be the further question about whether this, whether selling one's body for sex is consistent with human dignity or respect for the human person, or whether it's degrading, independent of the question of freedom versus coercion. So there are really two issues we have to, two questions we have to ask. Is it truly voluntary? And secondly, even if it is, um, is this choice at odds with human dignity or respect for the culture in question, or in this case, human sexuality? And this takes us right to questions about the good. And those are the questions that we hesitate to debate in public discourse, and I think we've got to try to get over that habit. We're afraid to have public discussions about deep values I think because there's a pervasive fear that somehow they will be more conflict-ridden and violent. Yeah. And yet the truth of the matter is, is that the effects of the commodification of value are, is far more violent in its effects than those conversations. That, so it, it's a real sort of distortion has taken place in our understanding even of what violence is in our understanding of what the consequences are of, of conflict. Um, well, there are certainly cases where uh, commodifying a good, especially under desperate circumstances, where the sellers are under desperate economic circumstances, if it's true that in those cases it's not a voluntary choice, then it is a kind, can, be, can be a kind of violence. So I, do th I think that that's an important Point. There's also a closely connected point that I think one of the reasons we hesitate to engage in public debate about the nature of the good life or the, or the character of goods and virtues is even if we don't think it will lead to wars of religion and violence, we are concerned about the fact that in a pluralist society, we disagree about the good, so there will be controversy, there will be a clash. And in a democracy, we would wind up imposing the values of some people on others. But I think, and that's a serious worry, but it's not an answer to that worry to say, all right, let's let markets decide these questions for us. For a reason parallel to the point that, that you just made, it's not that markets will decide these questions in a way that is neutral toward the right way of valuing goods. To consign these questions to markets is to presuppose that the proper way of valuing them is as commodities. So if we don't decide, debate and decide questions of the good in democratic public discourse, markets will decide these questions for us. It's not that there's some neutral alternative. Some of us economists, after reading your book, need a little bit of advice. You talk a lot about love. 
Okay, right. right. In an earlier session here, we had two, one former Harvard professor and one current one, Marcia Sen and, uh, and uh, Cornell West. And where things really heat up that night was when Amarcha offered, he said, why don't we talk about love? So in the Harvard tradition, I look at the debate you've had with Larry Summers, the writings of Dennis Robertson, and also some of the discussions in your book about giving gifts. Right. Economists would have you give cash gifts, because right. otherwise you're constraining what the person receives. Right. Could you, could you, right. could you flesh us out and help us uh, all with our love lives? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, and, and love is related to a gift and the giving of a gift. Um, I'd like to, to get to the topic of love and economists through a concrete example. One of the most influential studies about the effect of commodification in recent times was a book in the early 1970s by the British sociologist Richard Titmuss. Some of you probably remember this book. It was called The Gift Relationship, and it was, it was about blood donation. And he's compared the US and the UK system of blood donation. In the UK, there were, you couldn't buy and sell blood. You could only donate it voluntarily, without pay. In the US, you could donate blood at the local Red Cross, or you could sell it. There were blood banks that bought and sold it. And his conclusion was, on practical and economic grounds, the British system works better, a more reliable supply, less tainted blood, and so on. But he also made an ethical argument against a market in blood, saying that if you allow the buying and selling of blood, you drive out and devalue the altruism of giving, giving to a stranger, even. This generated a debate, including among some economists who were paying attention. Because from an economic point of view, if, you have, if some people want to give stuff away, and other people want to buy and sell that stuff, both groups should be free to proceed as they, as they choose. Just because blood is being sold by some people somewhere doesn't mean I can't still give it freely if I want to the economist would say. And one economist who wrote a long critical review of the Titmus book fastened on this point. He's one of the most distinguished American economists of his time, Kenneth Arrow. And he concluded his review of Titmus by making this argument against using, al insisting on altruism as a basis for, for blood donation. He said, like many economists, this is Arrow, I do not want to rely too heavily on substituting ethics for self-interest. I think it is best on the whole that the requirement of ethical behavior be confined, confined to those circumstances where the price system breaks down. Why, he said, because we do not wish to use up recklessly the scarce resources of altruistic motivation. <laughs> so the idea is, that altruism, love, sympathy, generosity are scarce resources that are depleted with use. Now, it's easy to see how this, I would call it economistic conception of virtue, if true, provides uh, good grounds for extending markets into every sphere of life because other people can still go on doing what they want if they want to be generous and so on. What I didn't realize when I first, so it's the idea that, that generosity and virtue are like fossil fuels. The more you use, the less you have. I didn't realize when I read this that this, draws, uh, this, this idea goes back among economists, this economistic view of virtue, to a, a highly respected Cambridge UK economist who gave a speech at the bicentennial 
of Columbia University, here, not far from here. And the subject of his lecture was what does, it was a question, what does the economist economize? Uh, this, this, was, uh, this was Sir Dennis Robertson. This was in 1954 at Columbia. And his answer was, look, he realizes economists deal with the aggressive impulses of human beings, but they still have an important moral mission. And that is to help to, to reduce serene, to reduce the preacher's task to manageable dimensions. <laughs> and here's how. The economist can help by promoting policies that rely whenever possible on self-interest rather than altruism or moral considerations. And by doing this, the economist saves society from squandering its scarce supply of virtue. So here's where the idea first finds full articulation. And he ended with this. If we economists do our business well, we can, I believe, contribute mightily to the economizing of that scarce resource, love, the most precious thing in the world. <laughs> now, to those not steeped in economics, this seems like a strange way of thinking. I mean, imagine, imagine a loving couple would they really think to themselves that they should treat one another for the most part when they can in calculating fashion so as to save their love for the moments when they really need it? That's <laughs> the idea of hoarding love. And, or, would they, or would it turn out that loving acts toward one another actually would increase this resource? One, I, I heard echoes of this. Years later, Rob mentioned that I had a, t actually taught a course, which was a series of debates with my, my colleague, Larry Summers, a course on globalization and, and markets. And when, when he was president of Harvard, he was asked to, to give the morning prayer in Memorial Church at Harvard. And his theme was, um, what economics can contribute to thinking about moral questions. And at the end of his, his prayer, his commentary, he, he replied to those who criticized markets for relying on selfishness and greed. And this is what he said, quote, we all have only so much altruism in us. Economists like me and I'm quoting still, think of altruism as a valuable and rare good that needs conserving. Far better to conserve it by designing a system in which people's wants will be satisfied by individuals being selfish and saving that altruism for our families, our friends, and the many social problems in this world that markets cannot solve. So this is Robertson uh, restated. Now, the metaphor, I think, is misleading. Altruism, generosity, solidarity, and civic spirit, these are not like commodities that are depleted with use. I think they're more like, the, the better, better metaphor is to think of them as, as muscles that grow stronger with exercise. And I think one of the defects of the market society we have come to inhabit is that it gives us fewer and fewer occasions to exercise those muscles and to develop those virtues. Thank you.